Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much uh, to the organizers for, for welcoming me and Sheikh Hamza as well. We decided to refer to each other on a first name basis, so I think that's easier. So Hamza and Sivin here, because this is a conversation uh, between new friends and some of you are older friends whom we have met at other occasions. So I'll go straight into the topic, uh, and I think um, it will be interesting to just offer a bit of a personal and Christian perspective, and you will probably understand why as I go along. So how, do I, how did I come to this topic myself, personally? In 2002, I actually started a blog, and I would like to claim I'm the first Malaysian pastor who blogged at a blog. I have stopped already, as you can see, the end and the beginning. So the beginning of not blogging, but that was in 2014 or 15. But I started off as a blogger, partly because I wanted to find a way to express uh, some thoughts, and this was the era of blogging, where blog was the word of the year. And, but I didn't want to b become a blogger like some uh, teenager with a lot of angst and just complaining about life, but really just sharing about what my faith meant for me, uh, how life was, what food I like to eat. You now, long before the days of us taking pictures for Facebook, I would like to claim I started doing that in 2002. But this was actually my way of entry into the world of the internet, the world of blogging, the world of where sometimes I think I was tempted to see myself larger than life. Or at least others would see me and say, well, this guy. Uh, that's the more downside of things. But of course, the more positive part was I actually made many friends, uh, people from different parts of the world, and some from the United States started to read about a Christian living in Muslim-majority Malaysia and what that meant for me. And through that, actually, uh, we became friends, and I've actually met some of them either in Chicago or Colorado or anywhere else in the world, like UK, because of this blog that now is no longer I'm not updated anymore. And I call it Seven Kids Garden because in reality, I'm not a real gardener. <laughs> but I like to plant seeds for a better world because for me, hopefully these thoughts would... Um, encourage and inspire others to think about uh, life. So that was how I started. And during that time, in 2004, I noticed some interesting things going on in the Christian community. For example, there was this uh, website called Ship of Fools. Okay? And Ship of Fools started a project uh, called Church of Fools. Okay? Why Fools? Because um, it is a very young uh, site meant for young people. And there is a verse in the Bible that says that um, what is uh, foolishness, uh, what is the wisdom of God is actually foolishness for man, you know. So it was like kind of a way of just challenging the way we think about our own self-sufficiency. But Ship of Fools was a three-month experiment by the Methodist Church and it was meant for people who did not want to go to church in UK. And if you've ever been to the West, you know that the church is emptying or either graying. And they will try to experiment with this. And since you know that this was the heyday of the hype of the internet, as if the internet would solve all our problems, as if technology will provide every solution to our lives. And the church was more like trying to experiment to see whether this was relevant to people. This was the heydays of Second Life, those of you who remember where you have this virtual persona and you could be someone else in this program, right? I'm not sure whether it's still functioning now. But uh, what you could do is actually you can go in and you can have an avatar and you can attend a church service. And they actually got real pastors to be a real pastor in the church service. So I joined it once. And to my horror, uh, okay, let's, to my horror, people were, like, were jumping up and down in this virtual church, in their avatars. Uh, some people were shouting, and there were some things that were really strange going on. Maybe people were being playful, there were troublemakers. So the moderator had a difficult time trying to control what was going on. But at the same time, there was also interesting things that cropped up. There were some discussions at the sideline. So this is like the tension, right? On one hand, it created a space for people who felt disconnected with the physical 
space of worship to reconnect with faith. On the other hand, because partly it was an experiment, you felt that how do you find order? How do you control an environment like that? And uh, it was a free for all, and there were people just coming in and out. So that's the kind of tension that I saw in this experiment. To some extent, it's similar to what I saw in the world of blogging, because there were those who were using blogs of their websites, often venting frustrations. Some of them quite anti-religious, uh, institutional religion, very anti uh, a lot of frustration. But on the other hand, you had blogs that were really sharing genuine spiritual experiences. Same thing going on here. So here you have this kind of like a tension, right? A tension with technology. And Christians, I think I observed that this was there for me as a Christian pastor. That time I was already a pastor. And um, as well as members of the church. And now in 2017, so 2002, 2004, now 2017, uh, I'm in touch with some of these fellow scholars around the world, some Muslims, Christians, secular, you name it. They are part of this network for new media, religion, and digital culture studies. If you go online, you see, now we're talking technology, search for digital religion, uh, dot, I think, T-M, T-A-M-U something, E-D-U. So, uh, it's a great site just to see how scholars are studying religious people using technology. So for example, there's one book here called I Muslims up there. Uh, there's another on, you see, kind of a religion and meets new media. Because now, like it or not, every religious person has a mobile phone, more or less. Uh, if in, in most parts of the world, there's touched by modernity. And even I have um, uh, 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 the Quran in, uh, app on my phone because I'm interested to learn from my fellow Muslim uh, friends and also learn about Islam for my own uh, enrichment and study. And I even have uh, Jakim's app as well, our religious department's app, just to know what's going on. I'm curious with the questions that people are asking our religious authorities. So I, I also have Ikim, that's our Institute of uh, religious uh, Islamic thinking. I listen to their radio on and off. So it's amazing how technology facilitates that. Uh, but yet at the same time, you have things like Church of Fools, where really they behave like fools, probably not in the way that, that we would have wanted them to. Now, going back to history a little bit, I'm a Lutheran pastor. This year we are celebrating 500 years of the Lutheran Reformation which is Martin Luther, uh, the founder of the Lutheran Church, nailed the 95 Theses on a church door at Wittenberg. And this was his challenge to the corrupt religious institution of his time. And I used to joke about it. Before the bloggers put their first post, Martin Luther posted 95 Theses on the Wittenberg door, a castle church door. It was his, he was the first blogger. And there was actually an article that wrote about this. And... Our relationship, the Protestants' relationship with technology and media very much can be brought back to Luther because this was also the time of the printing press where you move from a more oral-based culture to a written culture. And now all ideas can be accessed through paper, through books, even today. It all depends on the printing press because they use movable type. You don't need to have people to copy anymore. Rather, you can put all these letters together and print immediately, like what they're doing here. And that really revolutionized um, the way Protestant faith interacted with the Catholic faith of that time, a few hundred years ago. And you would even have pamphlets where even the Catholic Church or those who are against Luther, I'm talking about the Middle Ages now, not the current Catholic Church, they would have caricatures of uh, of they will make Luther look like a devil, you know? It was like very polemical, intra-faith debates going on. And they were using technology. So on one hand, technology was used to spread the good news. On the other hand, technology was used to really condemn the other person and often uh, unfairly as well. Both sides uh, within religion. 
Now today, we talk about the digital revolution. But in many ways, it all goes back here. The moment you had the printing press, and later you had television, the broadcast media, and then now you have the so-called social media, which on one hand, it's quite amazing. Some people say, oh, Sivin, you have 4,000 friends. Well, probably I think you have more. <laughs> Facebook page, whatever. Or how many likes you get. But are they really my friends? Or are they more of acquaintances? You know. So there's something to reflect on when we say Facebook uh, friends. What does that really mean? Once upon a time, they only had likes. Then people were quite upset. Why can't I say, say don't like? You know, and then they changed the emoticons last year. So you notice that there's this interaction, the shaping of our minds as well as being shaped by us at the same time. There's a dynamic going on. And religious people like us, we use Facebook too. And we, we have Facebook groups. Some of us have study groups within. And sometimes there is inter-religious interaction. Like Justin would look at my, my wall. I would look at Justin's wall, find out what Universal is doing. But at the same time, sometimes we are just talking amongst ourselves. And we might be just sharing the similar ideas, and we're in a ghetto. And scholars have already shown that this to be true. I mean, Luther would be really quite amazed to see the current Pope giving a TED talk here, right now. So the current Pope, Francis, is quite different from the stereotype of many Popes that we know today. And he used this very powerful medium actually to share about tenderness, and what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. So here you see the tension between faith and religion uh, and Christianity in this specific case. Are you all still with me? I hope I'm clear. All right. I'll go on. So the question is how is, or how should, or how can, it depends how you want to frame it, technology help or hinder growth and maturity of religious faith? I mean, that's the way we are looking at it. I mean, is it a friend or an enemy? Is it a problem to our solutions? Once upon a time, some Christians thought that with technology, we probably can reach out to more people. Or, but on the other hand, sometimes some wrong ideas also, viral ideas also reach out to more people too. So the challenge of good ideas and bad ideas is equally available online. Does it offer you freedom? Some of my church members joke with me and said, Oh, pastor, I wasn't at church uh, uh, last week because I was in a home church. I said, what does that mean? I was in my, at my home on the internet. You know? uh, I mean, they were joking. Uh, but it's interesting because now some people would say, I don't need to meet with other believers. I can access all this online. Why should I meet another person? Why should I sit under your teaching? Right, So the individualistic aspects of religion is very real. Just only a couple of uh, uh, days ago, someone told me, you know, I don't even need to read the Bible. I said, why? He said, because I can just go to this website, ask a question, and this website will just give me the verses that I need. Right? Then we went into a very interesting discussion about the importance of reading the Bible in context, the study of it, the methodologies and all that. So... I want to just go a bit thematic now, just from a bit of background to history, and just think about what uh, today's forum challenges to think about this notion of idols, the self, and even false prophets. So I'll start with the self. I want to con I congratulated the designer for this poster. This poster is very good. The poster for today's event, because. Uh, a few of my design people friends said to me, this is such a good poster, all right? And why? For me, it's because you notice that it really brings out the struggle about us human beings, not just religious people, and technology, right? On one hand, we invented the tech, right? We are supposed to shape the way the technology is supposed to go. On the other hand, something seems to have gone wrong. It's like a Frankenstein. Technology seems to have shaped us, or at least we unconsciously allow it to shape us. 
until we think we may be the omniscient, all-knowing, by asking Google, right? That's next to all-knowing God, like person, all present, omnipresent. Why? Because when you're online, it feels like you, you, you are everywhere, right? On the web. All uh, omniscient, uh, all present, all knowing, all powerful. Some people think that when they're online and they're Facebook, they just need to click like, 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 and they will change the world. We call them clicktivists, not activists, because they only click. After you click, they do nothing about it. No donation of money to a cause, no volunteering to Islamic relief. I was very pleased to talk with Hamza and find out that he's part of Islamic Relief that actually works in partnership with the Lutheran World Federation uh, World Service on a number of crises, catastrophes around the world. So is that really what it's all about? Now, there is a verse in the Bible, and since this, the theme is exchange verses, I thought it would be great to throw some verses up. In the first book of the Old Testament, book of Genesis, uh, this is the foundation of, uh, I think there's a similar doctrine here, the idea of we are created in the image of God. And for Christians, it's based on this verse. God said, let us make humankind or mankind in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion, or scholars would say rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the wild animals, earth of the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image, and the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now the word dominion is important because some people misunderstand this word as domination, do, like an oppressive power. But rule over can convey a kind of stewardship, a management, a co-creator, someone who is entrusted by God to actually represent, being the image, represent God and God's character in this world. That is what humans are supposed to be. At least here, based on the, I'm just presenting what I understand from the Christian perspective, which is accepted as a consensus. And the danger, of course, is when this image is distorted. This is a very interesting article because this blogger, who was very famous, uh, at least one time, decided to stop blogging. Why? In his article, he actually wrote in detail about this. But there's a summary quote there. He says that his whole life was just an endless bombardment of news and gossip and images that has rendered us man manic information addicts. It broke me, he said. It, it might break you too. And I think the title is very telling. And this is not even a religious person writing. He doesn't write from a faith perspective. Just an ordinary guy saying, I used to be a human being. Because it came to a point in his life, he felt that he was just chasing after how many people would comment on him, how many people would spot his blog, how famous he could be, the larger and life persona. And as a Christian, I would say, this, when we lose or our, the image of God is distorted, Actually, we put ourselves to become idols. And uh, idols, in a sense, we, we become the center of it all. Uh, Martin Luther had a very interesting definition of sin. Because once upon a time, you and I might think sin means uh, for some smoking, drinking, all those are sinful acts, we know. But Luther defined sin as the self curved in. I think that's very insightful. When the self is curved in, I, me, and myself is the center and not God and not even someone else. And that is a distortion of Genesis chapter 1. The other thing I like to highlight is this uh, about life and wisdom. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, and this is another interesting verse, it says that, let me go in 7, God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. I like this. The emphasis on life, the emphasis of us as a human being, <laughs> not a human doing. All right? 
And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, Lord, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight, to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So there are two trees, according to the Christian teaching here. One is the tree of life, which is what our focus should be. The other was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And many of us are familiar with the story of Adam and Eve chose to eat of the fruit of the good and evil. The so-called the knowledge of good and evil and their eyes open. And many scholars remind us that this is less about a talking snake, uh, with due respect to <laughs> Dawkins, or less about just them eating an apple, which it never said it was an apple. It was about human beings wanting to open their eyes to be self-sufficient and to decide what is good and evil with their own standards. And I think that is really one of the challenges that we have today. It is not so much of how much information do we have, it's how do we decide which is good and which is bad. How do we discern what is the knowledge of good and evil? Or more than that, how do we discern it in a way that is converges and is congruent with our faith convictions rather than maybe just some anything goes. Uh, so I keep joking with people, with my students, I said, I am not a relativist in the sense that you may think I may be just because I'm asking you to think, to pose questions. You know, There are standards and there are norms. That's why this is funny. I like this cartoon. I'm looking for the meaning of life, the man says. And then his wife says, try Google. <laughs> but even if you try Google, it depends on what question you ask, right? And even after you get all, it, all of it, you might have some knowledge, but does that mean you have wisdom? Because there is a difference between wisdom and knowledge, between transformation of life and information. All, there are plenty of people with plenty of information, but it doesn't mean they would live wisely. And Proverbs in the Bible does remind us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, or in some translations, wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And that's found in Proverbs, uh, the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. And, and this is interesting as well, because many of you would remember Galileo, right? So there you have Galileo, and this is the famous uh, picture where get art piece by this artist in the 1754 that tries to show, depict the tension between faith and science, faith and reason. But I'd like to highlight something that you should notice is the technology part of this painting. What is the technology part? Telescope. That's right. Because Galileo found out from the Dutch that there was these glasses that he could use that was not just only good for the sailors, but actually now he could look at the moon. And then because of that, that instrument, that technology, in other words, challenged the religious authorities of that time to some extent. But many of people misunderstand Galileo. He is one of the most misunderstood scientists. Why? Because Galileo, he said, there are two books for us to study. One is the book of scripture. One is the book of nature. When you come to the book of nature, the telescope helps me to appreciate nature. When it comes to the book of scripture, it is the scholars that help us to understand it with different methods. So there's a scientific methodology and there is the so-called uh, scriptural methodology, but both are trying to pursue truth or at least to see God's revelation in nature as well as in the scripture. So Galileo never really separated uh, the book of nature and the book of scripture. And his use of the telescope in this sense was meant to actually see the hand of God in some ways, to see his handiwork, his beauty, the creation of God. And this is just a side way coming to the point of, for Galileo actually, in many ways, it was out of a fear of God I think, deep down, was his fundamental motivation and his curiosity, of course, about the world that moved him forward. So that's just a side one to come to this point. Another interesting verse in the Bible uh, from Ecclesiastes is written by a preacher 
And here it talks about the importance of study, the importance of knowledge. And let me just briefly quote it for you. This teacher said, this is in the Old Testament, in the wisdom literature, besides being wise, the teacher also taught people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs. The teacher sought to find pleasing words and he wrote words of truth plainly. The sayings of the wise are like goats and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings that are given by one shepherd. Of anything beyond these, my child, beware. Of making of many books, there's no end. Yeah, if you go to Big Bad Wolf, right? Uh, sales, which I'm going probably afterwards uh, on the way back. <laughs> It's really, there's no end to these book sales and this making of many books. Too much study is weariness of the flesh, all right? So you get tired studying. The end of the matter, this book says, all has been heard, fear God and keep his command, commandments, and that is the whole duty of everyone. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret thing. Remember, good or evil. Remember Genesis? So this is where there is God's standards, there is a norm. Of course, our interpretation of it may differ, but we are pursuing truth, knowledge, and ultimately wisdom. Now, technology, in the case of Galileo, the telescope, or even today, the microscope, really has opened the minds of human beings and has done great, provided us with great assistance but it is also often the same human minds that invented bombs and they would scheme military uh, strategies. And even though I wouldn't say technology is totally neutral, but we cannot divorce it from really a distorted human image. It's both ways. Some sense technology shapes us, but we shape technology too. And it could be for good or evil. It's good, to be a, it's good to be reminded today that ultimately it's about fearing God, keeping His commandments and knowing our duty. And I guess that's probably a similar theme that will come out afterwards. Okay, just a couple of more things, a couple of scriptures, exchanging scriptures. I just went with the theme uh, a bit on discernment. I love this word very much. And humility. And what do I mean by that? This addresses the topic of false prophets. This is a letter from the prophet Jeremiah. And he wrote this letter to the people of Israel when they were in exile. This was around 500 to 600 BC or before Common Era. All right? And he wrote this letter because they were judged by God uh, for their lack of justice, for idolatry, and they were taken into exile into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And some... And during that time, uh, Prophet Jeremiah had to deal with false prophets. Because these false prophets told the people that their exile would only be two years. Whereas Jeremiah said it would be 70 years. It's going to be long. Why? You need a long time to learn some lessons in life, to learn to be humble. And during this time, J Prophet Jeremiah told the people who were in exile, in this case the Old Testament, the people of Israel, the Jews, that they should seek the welfare of the city. Verse 7, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. This is God speaking, the Lord speaking. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for it is welfare, you will find welfare. And thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, and this is my point here, verse 8, Do not let the prophets and diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie and they are not prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. So Prophet Jeremiah is warning the people of Israel not to just listen to all these prophets who seem to give them false illusory hope because this is a time that they need to go through judgment. Now, in technology, in the world of internet, there's 101 opinions about 101 things. And some people will tell us the world will be fantastic. Others will tell us it's going to be a doomsday. It's hard to decide who is really telling us the truth. On one hand, you'll get a, a WhatsApp message from someone and then they'll give you some ideas that are really strange. I mean, if you don't mind me going to a slightly controversial topic, 
when Donald Trump made the announcement on Jerusalem, already I had interesting uh, WhatsApp messages coming to me. And some were making certain claims that I wonder whether it is according to the scriptures, at least the Christian scriptures. Uh, there are some wild understandings. Now, I just came back from the Holy Land and I walked in Bethlehem, bringing some pilgrims in order for them to understand uh, the meaning of the sites. And, um, and it was interesting to relate to, to people in Bethlehem behind the wall. So I think for many of the Christians, it was an eye-opener of what life is there. So uh, we get these messages. Are these truly prophetic words from God? I think there needs to be discernment. I think we shouldn't be too quick to decide. Now, some Christians are very quick to decide. I would say, no, let's slow down, go back to the original text. Let's look at it, see what it really means. We have a tradition of interpretation. We have good scholars to teach us. And we have Palestinian Christians who actually would tell us their experience of what is it like to be in the West Bank. At least these are the ones I know. I have personal friends who are there even as we speak. So when I was, okay, in Bethlehem, for example, I had a chance to meet with my friend Munta Isha, a Lutheran pastor in the middle of Bethlehem, and I invited him to Malaysia. Hopefully we can do a joint event. Uh, that will be an interesting discussion on that point. But at the same time, some of my Muslim friends were also telling me they are getting WhatsApp messages too. And they are getting all sorts of videos. And, uh, and we, we are having a conversation. What does this mean? Especially in Malaysia, when these things can be quite tricky. So we have to be discerning. We have to be cautious. Now, this is uh, a meeting, a picture of a meeting of my friends, a bunch of uh, Lutheran scholars, pastors. We were I just came back from Geneva. This is just last week, fresh. You're getting this the first time. And this is part of the Lutheran Interfaith Network. This is where I found out that uh, the Islam Islamic Relief and the Lutheran World Service uh, are doing joint projects together. Now, this is an example of an intercultural discussion within the faith. So we have a Latin American with a guitar. He, he works with indigenous people in Costa Rica. We have someone from the United States, someone from Finland, uh, someone from Germany. I'm representing Asia, Malaysia. And we were there to try to talk about how can we encourage Lutheran Christians to engage in more interreligious, interfaith work for relief, as well as dialogue, understanding. And one of the challenges that we all agreed on was the challenge of discernment. Because many of our church members may have a certain notion, an idea of what a Muslim believes or what is their practices. And often those are not informed by actual relationships. Often they're informed by usually just stereotype media presentations or maybe bad experiences. Let's face it, there are good Christians, bad Christians. There are probably good Muslims and bad Muslims, good Buddhists, bad Buddhists, so on. I mean, we human beings are really sinful and we are quite good at it, expert in many ways. Uh, and of course, for some of my Muslim friends, they say during Ramadan, they hope to make amends. And for Christians, we have the seasons of Lent and we're in the season of Advent. There are four weeks before Christmas and they also try to be better Christians, right? So we, we, we realize that this is a problem within our communities and we have to help them to discern who are the false prophets? Or who are the true, who are the people speaking the truth? And sometimes the truth can be painful for us. And I think when we deal with technology, sometimes we have to deal with the truth of how technology has affected us in ways that draw us away from God, away from our fundamental beliefs. And, and this is the irony. On one hand, we were talking about these things, but we were using a program called Adobe Connect right now. So we had people from Latvia, Canada, Peru, uh, I think Germany, and other places. And this is the paradox. We are using technology to talk about the problem of technology <laughs> as well. Do you see the tension? So I, I'm not here to give simplistic answers. 
Because on one hand, probably we will hear that technology is fantastic. It's God's gift for us. On the other hand, it could be technology is all demonic and it's God's curse to us, right? But I guess in reality, it's going to probably be a mix of both. And we as people of faith, I would encourage us from a Christian perspective means that we can be discerning. And what's the criteria? Does this technology dehumanize us to make us not no longer in the image of God or in the way that we should be representing God's standards? Or does it take us away from relationships rather than bring us together? In this case, it brought us together. But in many cases, the phones around the table during dinner time takes us away from each other. We are before one another, but not face to face. It's face to screen, screen to face. So I joke with people, do we have a screen to screen relationship or a face to face one? And during this time, we ask the question, how can we foster better interfaith relationships? And in their answers, almost everybody said this, apart from shared projects, we need more face to face encounters with one another. That was a common theme across every country. And I think that is really something that is also found in the scriptures. I know for sure in the Old Testament, the importance of having face-to-face -face relationships. Um, I will end soon. This part is talking about humility because I think that one of the challenges of those of us who have access to technology is that we think we have a God-like view of the world. Whereas I would tell you for sure, and I've talked to people in Google, Facebook, I was at the United Nations uh, meeting for peace building recently, uh, last year actually, uh, and as most recent as last year in Bangkok. And they said, uh, Facebook, they had a Facebook representative there. They were talking about the difficulty they had to uh, deal with different kind of news that was going around. So in other words, there's a certain level of the algorithms. There's actually technical things behind this. There are reasons why we see certain things more on our feeds. That these are more technical is beyond me, but I thought that was very interesting. So it's not so simple. It doesn't mean that just because we go online, we necessarily have everything unfiltered, unchecked. So this verse is to remind me to mature in my faith, to be humble in my presentation of my views. Of course, when it comes to God's word, God's revelation, we can be firm. When God says we need to take care of the widow, take care of the poor, nothing ambiguous about that. But there are some things that probably we might debate in some details, of course. Even amongst the Muslim scholars we know, there are different views on certain aspects similar to the Christian theologians. But this is from Paul uh, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians. He said, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, I love this part. For now we see in a mirror dimly. Now, here on earth, all of us human beings see it dimly. But then we will see face to face. Now I only know in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. And these three, the greatest of these is love. In other words, he's saying, as long as we are here on earth as a human being, I won't have the full picture. One day we will see everything in full, but now we only see in part. Even myself, I don't fully understand myself. Actually, my wife sometimes tells me, I don't know whether I married the same man or not. <laughs> because less than that, about maybe 20 years ago, I was like this, but I've changed. And, uh, and I, I say likewise, you know, we're all changing and we're learning more about ourselves. And sometimes I wonder about myself too. But ultimately, I think what is important is really about truth and true freedom. And I close the, with the words of Jesus. And as a Christian, for me, the most central is really the words that come from Jesus. And this is from the John where he says, if you continue in my word, and this is a challenge to Christians, and I 
offer it as a word of encouragement to those who are with me today. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. So being a student is important. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In other words, we are people who want to pursue truth ultimately and true freedom. And if technology helps us pursue that, thanks be to God. But let's be a bit careful here because technology in many ways may draw us away from truth and actually be perpetuating lies. And that actually would all bound us more than set us free. But I think the good news is tonight, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, afterwards, I'm looking forward to have the interaction and the questions where we converge and where we may have some differences, and that's fine. But we are here face to face. And I want to thank the host today because uh, he fed me with a fantastic lamb. Uh, his lamb burger was really so good, and the chips. And I fe felt, you know, at the end of the day, it's really about eating together. <laughs> it's really about spending time with each other that we may pursue truth together. Galileo was about truth. I think we are about truth too. And um, may God bless you and thank you for uh, listening here. Alhamdulillah. So, I want to say a couple of things ahead of time so as to get the disappointment of my audience out of the way. First of all, every person has inside of them an ego which is the happiest when it's treated like a special snowflake and it thinks it's unique and it's special and I'm here to deliver everyone the bad news. The one who will take it the most harsh, harshly is myself, that it's not the case. As important as each of us think we are and as important as we derive even our attendance, uh, as much as importance as we even derive from our attendance in this gathering, uh, really we're not that important and we're not that unique and we're not that special and our problems are not unique either uh, they're problems that everybody has had they're the same problems that our forefathers if they lived in caves at one time they still have and it's the same problems that our our, our descendants will have until the day of judgment uh, no matter if they're flying in the stars in space and shooting lasers and doing all sorts of other uh, strange and wonderful things so the basis is really related to the song that I, 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 I shared with everybody, which was in the Arabic language, and it has to do with the idea of what? It opens with the verses in which the metaphor for a lover who is asking for the hand of the beloved in marriage, so the beloved, okay, my, this is what I need from you. This is what? It says, just a like a body broken with tiredness, uh, uh, and a spirit which is constantly in, in being dis is constantly in discomfort. It's constantly disturbed. And eyes that never taste. And a heart in which there's nothing other than than us. So if you want to still uh, uh, propose, if you still want my hand, then pay up. Then what? Pay up. And if you want to, to skip a couple of lines forward, because this is not a literature class, uh, but to skip a, a couple of lines forward, one of the, 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 the images that's that particularly beautiful is what? Is that if you want to enter into my courtyard, then make sure you take your shoes off before entering. It's a beautiful carpet. Both myself and the Reverend uh, Sivin, we both... Uh, almost felt wrong stepping on the carpet with our shoes. Why? Because it was beautiful. You have an idea that things that are sacred and things that are holy, they shouldn't be polluted. What is the, the shoes in this metaphor? It's all things physical. It's all things that have to do with yourself, with your ego. You have to leave them outside because a sacred place, you'll dirty it, you'll disturb it. You will profane it if you bring your own filth with you inside. And 
what is clean and what is filthy, what is clean and what is dirty, those things are relative. Those things are, are relative. There are certain things that are more uh, pure than others, and there are certain things that are more filthy than others. What I want to start with is the idea that a human being is made up of a composite of two different things. A human being has a physical existence, and a human being has a spiritual existence. And they're two very different things. Your spirit and your body, they're meant to be with each other. They get along well with one another. Once they separate with one another, the body doesn't enjoy itself anymore. It will literally rot and turn into dust. It sees no point in continuing. Your spirit also doesn't have a full life until it's back with its friend again. And that's one of the reasons that in Muslim theology we believe that the resurrection and judgment and the pleasure of paradise and the torment of the hellfire, both of them, or all of the above, I should say, are not just spiritual, but they're in, in the flesh as well. They're, in, they're bodily as well. However, the fact that the two of them are together and they're made for one another, it doesn't negate the fact that the spiritual has a superior position over the physical. The spiritual has what? A superior position over the physical, just like a rider has a, a superior position over the horse that he's riding. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen a, it's fine, Barakallah, I just, this is a thing that happens when I speak, I sweat, okay? I don't, I don't know, I mean, and it, and it's, I'll be honest, it's, KL's hot, man, it's way hotter, it's, it's hotter than I thought it would be, so, yeah, Chicago's like, yeah, it's like negative 12 right now, yeah. So, the idea is what, have you ever seen a person try to carry the horse on his back? The whole world is filled with people like that. Is the rider meant to, is he built for carrying the horse, carrying that much weight? He's not going to be able to do it. He's going to collapse. Is the horse, does the horse know the way that it can tell the, 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 the rider that go take a left here or take a left there? No. Both of them, they, they both are killing themselves and they're going to kill each other in the process. They're both doing what? They're killing themselves and they're going to kill each other in the process as well. When the rider collapses and dies, does the horse know where it's going to find water from? Absolutely not. This is the, the, the mithal and the example of the time that we live in. This is the example of what? Of the time that we live in. Is that the spiritual which was always known to our forefathers to be superior to the physical. Everything is flipped backwards. And this is, I mean, the reason I'm talking about this is what? Is what is the technology? We see our technology and we become drunk with it. Like, the Reverend Sivan, he, and I'm not saying it as your title, I'm saying it as the fact that you're a reverend, you're a person who deserves respect. Like the Reverend Sivan said, what? He said that uh, uh, with regards to the technology, people start to, they get drunk, you know, they lose their senses. You think you're omniscient, you think you're omnipotent, you think you see everything, hear everything, you can do whatever you want to through the technology. And the fact of the matter is, we see less than we did before. We know less than we did before. We uh, uh, deal with one another less than what we did before. We get stuck in these weird cycles. Those algorithms, what were the algorithms that he was talking about? They have to do with fake news. The idea that people literally fabricate stories from the beginning to the end for some sort of purpose or for no purpose at all, just to create mischief. And they know how to game the system that the, the Facebook and Twitter and all these other social media uh, platforms will feed this story to the person who least needs to hear it. The person who already doesn't know anything about Muslims, they're going to feed them the story that Muslims eat babies. And the people who know the least about their Christian neighbors, they're going to feed them the story that the Christians have a, a conspiracy to wipe Islam off the earth. All of this other nonsense. What is it? That's exactly what it is, right? We think that, we think that what because of all of these things that we have, we become drunk with power. This is not something new with the internet, by the way. Every civilization, the Romans had a great civilization. Every civilization that fell before us, all of them, the same decadence came into them. First spiritually, and then it manifested itself, what? Materially. The idea that people, at, in the beginning of building something, whether it's a business, whether it's a family, whether it's an empire, whether it's whatever it is, in the beginning people 
they work hard. In the beginning, people are honest. In the beginning, people have these habits that lead them to success. And then afterward, what happens when they stop understanding what made them successful in the first place, they think that they'll be here forever. They think that they have power over the world around them. It happens with farmers as well. A farmer, imagine, they become, they become more skilled with time. They become more skilled as the age goes forward, as they gain years and, and life. The reason I'm giving the farmer as an example, I understand it's irrelevant to everybody's, everybody's life. The reason I give it as an example is what? Is to say that the fact that you're using iPhones and Androids doesn't make you any different than them. Even a farmer, somebody all of us look down on, even though we shouldn't. We think we're religious people because we're hanging out at Cafe Mocha on a Thursday night, whereas we could have been at home watching TV. We're worse than everybody else sometimes. We think we're better than other people, even a farmer, a simple person who doesn't know how to read and write. If he doesn't plant the crop properly, if he doesn't harvest the crop properly, what's going to happen? He's going to starve for the rest of the year. That's exactly, what, that's exactly what this technology has the potential to do. And I agree with a lot of things that the Reverend Simit said, Sevit said, and I disagree with some things as well. One of the things I disagree with is what? Is that the technology shapes us and we shape the technology in some sort of equilibrium. Undoubtedly, the technology will engender in us certain habits, but essentially the technology, what the effect of it is, is going to be a pure reflection of what's inside. So there are some people who are using the same uh, Twitter and the same Facebook to fight with their relatives. There are some people who are using it to connect with their relatives. There are some people who are using the, the, the same uh, social media and the same internet in order to make the world a better place, there are some people who are using it in order to cause havoc and mischief in the world. And the issue with it is what? There's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, there's a morsel of flesh, I'll spare you the Arabic, because mashallah, other than a couple of people, I don't think anybody, this doesn't look like the Arabic, the classical Arabic public, but it's there, mashallah. There's a morsel of flesh inside of the body, if the body is, or if that morsel of flesh is, it works. It's functioning properly. The whole rest of the body will function properly. And if it's spoiled, the entire rest of the body is what? It's spoiled. What is it? It's the heart. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he talks about it, the morsel of flesh is just the locus of the heart. It's not the actual physical heart that pumps blood. That's not what's being talked about. Rather, just like the physical body has differentiated organs and tissues, the spiritual body also has its own different apparatuses that allow it to function. And the physical heart and the spiritual heart, they occupy the same physical space, but they're different. What is the spiritual heart? It is a seat of intention. If a person is smart and the physical heart is good, they'll use their intelligence to make the world a better place. If a person's evil, they're evil smart people as well. I say they're smart on a short-term basis, that they know how to make money and hustle around and whatever. Long-term, there's a type of stupidity that comes with, with evil, which is what? The fact that somebody who thinks through things will, should realize that what? Should realize that the end is not going to be good. And this is part of religion, by the way. This is part of our deen as Muslims, is the idea that nothing, nothing matters with regards to any action or with regards to any person in a higher order than what? Than the way it ends. If the deed ends well, it means it's a good deed, no matter how turbulent it may have been in the middle. If a person has a good end, it means they're a good person, no matter how much turbulence they may have had in the middle. But at any rate, that person may have great intelligence. If the heart is wrong, the intention is wrong from the, from the beginning, what happens? The intelligence will be used in order to do something wrong with life. And further than that, people have all sorts of different character traits. Nobody's born good or evil. They're just, they are who they are. This is part of wisdom. Don't try to change yourself too much. Why? You're not going to be able to. If you have to carry 100 pounds, are you going to use a bird or are you going to use a camel? Right? Because the bird, no matter how much you take it to the gym and work it out, it's just, it's not made for that. So if you're cheap, you're a cheap person. Abdullah, what if you're cheap? Mashallah, it's my Wacom County crew up here, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Right? It's not Washington, D.C. It's Washington State. It's up in the middle of nowhere. We, we're, we're all from, we're, essentially, we're all from the same village. These three kids and me, we're all from the same village, mashallah. So we're trying to 
look real uh, savvy and smooth in the big city with the big shot people, but we're all, we're all from the same village. So if you're born cheap, is it a good thing or a bad thing? It depends on how you use it. If you don't, you know, if you don't give your family the, the, the money that they need in order to, you know, your wife gets sick and you don't pay for her medical treatment, it's bad. If you're cheap and they make you the treasurer in the, 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 the masjid, then your cheapness is actually helping the people. Why? Because it's, it, there's a good benefit from it. It has to do with what's inside. Coming back to the issue of, of, of technology, the thing is that we think technology is going to solve our problems. It's not going to solve our problems. It's just stuff. Stuff doesn't solve your problems. You cannot talk to your phone. It will, now it tries to talk to you. You say, hello, Google, and the thing will ask you a question. It's not really talking to you. It's not, it's not alive. It's dead. It's a piece of metal and glass. It's not your friend. I mean, it sounds so stupid, but it's true. People forget about all of these things. The same thing, I mean, the, the, the Reverend Simit was talking about what? Sivit was talking about what? The idea that people, like, they race to see how many comments there are on their, on their blogs and now Facebook posts and how many likes and retweets. And what is it? It's nothing. Somebody may have literally uh, accidentally pushed the button. It happens. But these things, people literally will kill themselves over these things. Do you know that? There are people, because of Facebook posts, they'll go kill themselves. It may have been a bot that posted the post that, that drove them over the edge. It's not really that big of a deal. The way that you're going to use, the way I'm going to use these things is what? Through an internal rectification, the rectification of the heart. You can use the technology in order to help that process, but that process is not going to come from stuff. It's going to come from people, specifically those people who already have their uh, internal state rectified. Keeping their company, learning from them, and then applying those lessons to yourself and to myself. And the issue is this, is the technology is a very potent tool. And this is one reason you have to understand why is it that that oftentimes religious people, scholars, uh, pious people, they have a very dim view of the technology. It's not because they're backwards. It's because what? Look, a sword, for example. A sword is a, a, a tool that a soldier uses. Or a knife. Let's, let's dial it back a little bit, not make it so militaristic because not politically. it's not politically correct. In the old days, people enjoyed those examples. Nowadays, it's not so fashionable. So a knife. So the, the sandwich that was the lamb sandwich that was made for uh, uh, Reverend uh, Civet when he came. It's a knife. You have to, you have to use the knife. It's, it's a tool. A knife is not good. It's not evil. It's just, you know, you use it for what you use it for, right? Imagine you have like a five-year-old child. So it's a tool. We, you know, we need knives. Without knives, we can't cook anything. What are you going to do? Hand the knife to the kid? Why, are you not, why, why is it a bad idea to hand the knife to the kid? Because it's a powerful tool, the, the child not knowing how to use it properly may harm themselves. What is it? There's a verse in the slides. I don't know if my thing is loaded up or not. I'm going to like let you bypass. There's a verse. I, they're not even in order, and I can't, I can't see them anyway. There's a verse. Allah Ta'ala says, La taqfu ma laysa laka bihi ilmun inna sam'a wal basara wal fu'ada kullu ula'aka kana anhu mas'ula. He said, don't, don't follow those things that you have no knowledge regarding. Why? Because the... The, the, the hearing and the sight and what's inside of the heart, you're going to be asked about all of those things. That's fine. If you find it, you find it. If you don't find it, just listen, inshallah, it will be sufficient. Why? Why is the, 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 the sight and the hearing mentioned here in accordance to the heart? It's because we have an idea in our, our religious tradition, our spiritual tradition as Muslims, that what? That the heart is like a, a city, like that, like a fortified city, and it has different gates that people can come in from. What are those gates? Those are called the limbs, but they're not the physical limbs. They're spiritual limbs. They're the way that that things get into the heart and affect the heart. What is it? It's your eyes. What is it? It's your ears. All of your senses: taste, touch, smell. What is it? It's your speech. A person may think when they speak, the words are going outward. But there's a, there's a, there's a like email, you know, you have CC in an email. There's a CC going to the heart as well. 
Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions this. We have, a, we have another a complete, completely like a, 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 a interesting set of narrations from the Prophet Isa salam, from Jesus Christ, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him, many of which are not in the Bible. Uh, and it's very interesting. Imam Ghazali, in particular, he quotes many of them often. So we have, and I don't know if it's in the Bible or not. You can tell me about it. I don't, I mean, I, I'll have to admit this is not a, an area of my expertise. Really, I have no expertise at all. I'm just sharing the two things that I heard from my elders and from my mashayikh and from the few righteous people I met in my life. That Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam and his disciples, they're walking by and they see the rotting carcass of a pig. Now, in the law of the Torah, a pig is a, a, a filthy and unclean animal, just like it is in our sacred law as Muslims. And imagine it's not a regular pig, it's a pig that's been dead for some time and the carcass is rotted, it smells bad, it's bloated. So they're all disgusted by looking at the carcass. And uh, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, he looks at it and he says, what wonderfully white teeth th this animal has. And they keep walking. Is, are you familiar with this? No. And so what happens after some time, you know, people used to have adab in the old days. They used to have good etiquettes and manners with their elders and with their teachers uh, and with the people of God. So they thought, maybe we missed somebody, something, let's think about it for a while. Hours pass by, nobody's able to make heads or tails. What, what was that all about? So finally, someone works up the courage. They say, they say uh, you, you know, we just wanted to know that you said that thing about the teeth of the pig, and it's technically true, but it seemed like, like why, why did you say that? He, said, why? he says, I know, I saw it. I felt the same way that everybody else did when I saw it. But I didn't want my tongue to be in the habit of speaking ill. Why? You may think you're cussing somebody else out and you're right, leaving nasty comments on someone's you know, Twitter feed and Facebook and all of this other stuff. You, like, don't read the comments in news, newspaper articles. It's a type of illness. It's a type of sickness. Don't read them. You may think you're saying bad about somebody else. What is it? It's just the garbage you're throwing it back into your own home. What is it? The things that you eat. That's why this is good. The Jaki map is good. You know, eat halal. Eat pure and clean things that are earned from good, pure money, not from cheating other people and harming other people. And what? The, 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 the sexual desires, the, the private parts, those things have a, an effect on the heart. Now, a child, a person, because spiritually many of us are children, we never subjected ourselves toward any sort of spiritual rigor. We now live in an age where we expect the uh, people who have some sort of spiritual training and some sort of knowledge of revelation to uh, hand us things uh, on a plate and give us customer service like a Walmart. Allah Ta'ala is not a Walmart. God is not there to, to please you. God is God. The master is the master. The slave is the slave. Everyone should know their place. But we expect what? Customer service. That sometimes the imams and the pastors, they, they're scared. If I say some truth, maybe nobody will come back next week. That's what our position is. And then what do you do? You hand someone... Something, the images, the pictures, the beautiful faces, the beautiful bodies, the money, the flash, the food, the drink, the cars, the houses, all of those things. They're going straight inside of the heart. The heart which was made for what? For God's remembrance. Remember the song we started with? If you love God, this is a, a beloved, not like just any, anyone you'll find on the street, like a, another face that you'll find on the street, and another body you'll find on the street. What is the dowry? Everything you have, you have to give all of it. And you have to give me a heart that what has nothing other than me inside of it. Now tell me something, if you're looking at all of these things, and you're listening to all of these things, and they're being filled inside of your mind, inside of your eyes, inside of your head by day and night, what's going to end up happen, happening? We believe that insan al haywan al natiq insan is the rational animal. And what, how do computers work, right? It's technology. Garbage in, garbage out. So what we think as lay people is a negativity or hostility toward technology by many religious people. It's not that. It's just the same type of caution that an adult should have when handing a, 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 a knife to a small child. Grow a little bit, learn a little bit. Show that you can deny yourself your desires for some time. Show that you have the ability to say no to things. Show that the rider has the ability to tell the horse no and to keep the horse on the correct path. 
Trust me, all of these technologies, they can be used for great good. Many of the technologies you use in the phones, by the way, they're developed. The, 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 the origin, origins of them, they come from what? They come from algebra that was made from, made and, 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 and discussed and spread to Europe by Muslim scholars. The trigonometry that was used to calculate how to find the Qibla in medieval times, pre-modern times, that's the same technology, that's, that's, that's the, same, the same mathematics that underpinned the technology for using the GPS that will tell you. It was really interesting. We took a cab today. Uh, someone was using the Waze app, the uh, cab driver, and the Waze app speaks, there's a voice in it that speaks English with a Malay accent. I thought that was like the, like the most amazing thing in the world. I was like, I was like, what, really? Like, that's awesome. That's, see, that's a good use of technology. You, you, cannot, you cannot be the rider that tries to pick up the horse and carry it around. It's going to destroy you in this world. It's going to destroy you the day you meet your Lord. It doesn't work that way. And the final thing I want to say, I want to finish before my time is up. I have, I think, 11 minutes or 10 minutes or something. Don't flash the sign at me. I'm going to get angry at you. I promise. You, you, you. No, 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 no. No, people have to go to work tomorrow. Who's going to listen for 20 minutes, right? The, no, right, the, right. So do, do you, this is our deal. You, if you, if, if I go over, you'll get, be angry with me. If you flash the sign, I'll be angry. Don't flash me the sign. I promise I won't go over. Okay. Yeah. It's adab, mashallah. The, the idea is, the idea is, and the, the last idea I want to share because I, I feel like my speech until this point is very simplistic. You didn't need somebody from America to come and tell you these things. But I would. And in the context of that, I would propose to you that just because an explanation is simple doesn't mean it's wrong. In fact, oftentimes the most simple explanations that make the most sense are, I mean, is making sense a sign of something being true or false? Sign of something being true. Oftentimes they're the most elegant and the most uh, uh, truth-filled uh, explanations, right? I'm not, I don't believe in conspiracy theory, the conspiracy theory mindset, uh, uh, you know, being paranoid all the time. It's only good to be paranoid if they actually are out to get you. If they're not, it doesn't work. So what's the last idea I want to talk about? Uh, the Ikim, you mentioned you had the Ikim app. Uh, uh, Ikim FM, there's an a English language program called Light of Life, uh, I think at 5.30 p.m. on Saturdays. So in the month of January, I recorded a four-part uh, four series uh, for that program on modernism. Modernism doesn't mean like being alive in 2017. Even if you live in a cave, you're, if you're alive, you're still alive, right? Modernism is a set of philosophies. So I discussed some of those philosophies. I think the la I'll discuss some of the things in more detail that I want to mention right now in the last installment, in the fourth Saturday installment, which is what? Which is the idea that the future is automatically going to be better than the past. This is an idea a lot of people have. It's not based on any sort of rationality. If tomorrow we all decide to kill each other, is the future going to be better than the past? No. The future might be better than the past. What will make it better? It's the actions. It's not the fact that it's the future. People have this idea of modernism. One of the ideas of modernism is somehow through technology we're going to solve all of our problems. The Reverend Sivit, Sivit mentioned what? He mentioned some people use all this technology to make bombs. We have a, t a technology, nuclear technology, that what? You can literally eradicate almost all of the world's population, not just of people, of like animals and plants as well. Like, only things that will survive is maybe certain types of cockroaches. In less time than it takes to deliver a pizza. Is technology going to save us all? The answer is maybe, if we use it right. It's not the technology that's going to save us. It's the us that's going to save us, if we're saved. And there's, there's no guarantee of any of that. People think technology, oh, well, Sheikh, uh, if, you know, if we have more advanced uh, uh agricultural techniques and huge agricultural machinery and we genetically modify the crops, which is a horrible idea, but we genetically modify the crops and uh, uh, we do all these things and we'll have greater harvest yields and we'll eradicate poverty. We'll eradicate hunger. We had the technology to eradicate the hunger 2,000 years ago. 1,400 years ago. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu during his khilafah it's written by the chronicles in the entire Arabian Peninsula. The Arabian Peninsula was a very poor place. It wasn't a wealthy land like the land of, lands of the Romans and the Persians where you actually have fertile uh, uh, agricultural lands that grow a lot of crops. 
in the Arabian Peninsula during the reign of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, they couldn't find any poor people in order to give the money of zakat for. So Sayyidina Umar, the people, the Baytul Mal people from Yemen through, through their peninsula, they have the same problem. So they asked, they wrote, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, commander of the faithful, what should we do with this? We don't know. The money is just sitting in the, in the treasury. And we have to give it so that the people's zakat is, is fulfilled and it's just sitting there. What are we supposed to do? We cannot find, we search, we cannot find people to take the money. But he said, at the end of it, just leave it in the, in the public square and whoever wants to take it will take it. That's, that didn't require Monsanto to make like some sort of franken-wheat, like disgusting uh, uh, like crop. It didn't require huge mechanical threshers. It didn't require factories. It didn't require any of those things. What did it require? A group of human beings, a group of human beings who say, I want to feed myself and I want my neighbor to be, uh, 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 be fed rather than I want to be the richest person in the world and my neighbor can go to hell as far as I'm concerned. Those hearts are not going to be made by iPhone. Those hearts are not going to be made by Facebook and Twitter. What are they going to be made from? I mean, this is not like a, it's, this is not like, this is not the masjid, so I'm not going to like hammer you with it. But the idea is we're talking about technology. If you're looking for it inside of your technology, you're barking up the wrong tree. Those hearts, when they're made, this technology, you'll see it will make the world beautiful. I don't see those hearts. I don't see people working on those things except for very few and far between. And I see a lot of people who think that this is going to make it for them. It's not going to make, the, make it for them. And it's interesting, like, people talk about, like, we're going to change the world. We're going to, like, uh, do stuff like we're going to... Um, what are we going to do? We're going to save the earth, right? You imagine, you know, if we like, Allah protect us, if we all nuke each other and kill each other, the earth will be just fine. The earth is like 5 billion years old. 10,000 years is like a percent of a percent or even less than that, right? After 10,000 years, the earth will be like, you won't even be able to tell that anything, anything wrong happened. We're not trying to save the earth. What are we trying to save? Ourselves. In yasha' yudhibkum wayati bi khalqin jadid. If he wishes to, he will throw all of you out. And he'll bring a new creation in your place, and it, it's not difficult for him at all. It doesn't bother him. Why? Because the master is the master and the slave is the slave. How fortunate is the slave that mends his uh, 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 relationship and his bond with his master? How fortunate is the slave after he sins and wrongs himself, he comes back to the master and asks for forgiveness. And the master is the one who wrote over his throne that my mercy outstrips my wrath. That's what we need to do. We need to sit, sit in the masjid. This is one beautiful thing, by the way, because this interfaith discussion is not like other ones. Why? Because the common thing between Christians and between Muslims is what? God taught us what his name is. The name Allah is something that also comes in the, 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 the biblical scripture. And it was used by Arabic-speaking Christians who were Christian when? When there was no Islam or Christianity in Malaysia or Indonesia. When the people in Germany were talking about Martin Luther, when, the, when Martin Luther's forefathers were still worshipping Thor and Odin. The name Allah was being used, the name of Allah which is taught to us through revelation, that the name of God, are, they, those people, they knew it. What you need to do is what? Sit in isolation, whatever your whatever your uh, uh, faith is, this will benefit you still. Sit in isolation. Shut the lights out. Your eyes, your ears. Turn off the music. Turn off all of these other things and let the heart be alone with what? With the divine name. It's the food of the heart. Don't you see when you haven't eaten or drank for some time, the body becomes anxious. If you haven't eaten for eight hours, your body becomes anxious. Even though you're not going to die, maybe you could Go without eating for another two, three days. If you drink water, you could go without eating for another two, three days. But the body becomes anxious because its food isn't there anymore. The only heart that's, the food of the heart is the remembrance of God. The food of the heart is what? Taking the divine name, La ilaha illallah. Right? The taking the divine name, Allah. And there are so many names. There are names God has His name in every single language. Some names that even people don't know. Take the divine name. That's the food of the heart. And if you find yourself in a, in a situation where you've gone eight hours without remembering God, 
and you're not anxious, what is the sign? If the body, the body doesn't, you know, eight hours or eight days go by and it doesn't affect you that you haven't eaten, what does it mean? What is your state? You're dead. The physical death is not really death. You'll come back, I promise. The spiritual death is the more horrific one. It's not death, it's like a mockery of life. It is a mockery of life. It is the, the, the existence of the people of the hellfire that you can neither say that they're dead nor can you quite say that they're alive either. It's a bad sign. The good, the, good, the good news is what? A miracle above all other miracles is what? That God brings the dead heart to, to life again. So if the spark comes inside, then repent, come back, and make that, 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 that connection strong again. I promise you, inshallah, you'll use your phone and you'll use your internet and your email and all of this for good, inshallah. You'll use it to make the world a better place. Even if one time you did something bad with it, you, know, you looked at something you shouldn't have or you said something you shouldn't have, you got into a fight with someone, this and that and the other thing, you know, just say sorry afterward and try not to do it again. Still, still, I, I give you the good news. You'll use all of these things for good things. But if that connection is not there and the heart is dead, then uh, it's, it's not going to be a bright future. These things are only going to make that demise faster. Allah Ta'ala protect us from ourselves. Allah Ta'ala protect us from our own egos. Allah Ta'ala protect us from a future in which uh, people don't take his name and don't remember him and uh, uh, protect us from uh, those who uh, want to profit at our loss, even though God is the one who creates from nothing. Everybody can be happy. The fact that you're doing well doesn't necessitate that your neighbor is, 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 is hungry. All of, us, all of us will be okay uh, as long as we take his sacred name. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala rasulihi Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. أجمعين